I am uh, very grateful to uh, to Bill for this uh, very generous introduction, which is certainly rich with uh, exaggerations. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, nonetheless, it's always pleasant to hear something good about about oneself. Uh, and I am very grateful to Anna Vasilieva, who uh, is an old friend. We, we were, recently we started. We, we tried to calculate how how, how long, but. But she's so young that I hesitate to tell you. <laughs> uh, but, but it's really a very long time. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for her uh, initiative in launching this series of uh, intellectual events dedicated to my father. It's very touching, and uh, not many people now uh, remember him. Uh, some do, but not many, and certainly uh, there is nobody who would uh, spend so much effort and time at organizing something uh, important in his name, so thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> talking about the subject, the new era of, new era of arms control, uh, um, it's, it's, it's something uh, looks sounds like a wishful thinking, because at present there is no era of arms control, there is a new crisis of arms control. Uh, crises of arms control happened many times in the past. Uh, in the past half a century, I would say, starting with late 50s. Uh, but this uh, crisis is unique because of two reasons. First of all, it comes after a time of great euphoria, great hopes, and great achievements. Arms control during the recent 50 years uh, scored a number of historic victories. Um, and uh, there was uh, a lot of um, complacency about that and hope that uh, that would go forever and arms control would stay forever and would um, gain momentum, expand, until brings us to the ideal, which is not in the Bible, but probably which uh, should be added, the, the ideal of total and complete disarmament, both nuclear and conventional, as mentioned in the Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, whether we will ever reach this ideal is not known, but the process is very important in and of itself. And the process was very su successful, starting with the uh, late uh, 18, 1980s, uh, starting uh, in particular with the Treaty on Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Missiles, and during all the ensuing period, till the year 2010, when the last arms control treaty start, the new start of Prague Treaty was signed between President Obama and President Medvedev. However, uh, all of a sudden, to many people, it, it was a great surprise, even shock. Uh, the thing started to move in an opposite direction. And now we have a uh, deepening crisis of arms control. So that is the first uh, thing which is unique to the present crisis. It comes after a time of great hopes and euphoria, and uh, it's like a cold shower on all those who are dedicated to this idea. Second phenomenon is that it's <coughs> really uh, comprehensive. It's not just one treaty. It's uh, a number of very important treaties that are crumbling one after the other. I will not go in detail. I presume that uh, the people in this room uh, are following uh, the events. And uh, after the uh, collapse of the INF Treaty, uh, the, uh, the new START Treaty most probably will follow in the same way. Uh, there is uh, no certainty whether it will be extended after it expires in 2021. And the, there is even less certainty that any new treaty might be uh, negotiated as a follow-on to the new start. But besides that, uh, other treaties are also uh, being undermined. Uh, 
the comprehensive test ban treaty, te test ban treaty uh, was recently put in doubt, and certainly uh, that was, will not be left without consequences. The problems with this treaty probably will grow. Open Skies Treaty is on the verge of being um, abrogated. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Review Conference, which happens every five years, uh, is due next year. And it will be a celebration of 50 years of the uh, entry into force of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it's almost doomed to be a failure, as since it will be anniversary, since it will happen after the previous review conference of uh, 2015, also was a failure. That may sign a very bad verdict for the future of this treaty. If not legally, then de facto. It is crumbling with new and new nations are uh, acquiring the idea of going nuclear. Recently, Turkey joined the club. Uh, certainly, Iran uh, gives a lot of trouble, to say nothing of North Korea and a number of other states. So, uh, the, the Nuclear <laughs> Weapon States Club, which now uh, has nine states, uh, with, 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 with high probability, will expand during the next 10 to 20 years. The last extension, as you know, was in 2006, when North Korea uh, conducted a nuclear test after having abandoned non-proliferation treaty in 2003. So, that is what is happening now. And so, talking about new era of arms control may be uh, possible only in a very hypothetical way. Uh, but the problems uh, with the future are certainly numerous, uh, and very serious. And the problems with the future lie in our present situation. Why hypothetical new era of arms control? Because presently, the mentality of the people and political leaders and political elites, development of technology, makes the uh, new era of arms control quite bleak as a proposition. As always, during a very serious crisis, a very dangerous crisis, uh, the crisis of uh, nuclear arms control, a lot of myths are being born. Those myths are invented by experts, either sincerely or with some uh, evil ideas, and they, are, they spread. And I will give you an illustration of several such ideas, which are quite popular now, and gaining uh, a growing support in political elites and within political leaderships of the most important states. One idea is that after the deep reductions of nuclear weapons, which happened during the last 30 years, nuclear weapons have once again acquired usefulness as instruments of foreign policy and even more as instruments of war. When the numbers of nuclear weapons reached as high as 50,000 in the world, the idea of using nuclear weapons uh, became quite uh, theoretical because it was understood that once a single weapon is used, it would be extremely difficult to stop escalation and eventually all those weapons would explode and end uh, the life of civilization and maybe even of biological life on our planet. And then Gorbachev and others and Sakharov before him and Gorbachev uh, and many others promoted the idea that nuclear weapons are not a simple, a, a normal weapon with a huge uh, explosive power. It's a very different, qualitatively different weapon because it cannot be used. It cannot be used without inflicting catastrophe on the whole world, and including the state that initiates such use. And that is why, since it's a catastrophe, there is no victory in a nuclear war. And eventually it got to the top level of political leaderships of the Soviet Union and the United States. And they signed several 
joint declarations which uh, stated very clearly that nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. And that was the basis for uh, rapid and uh, very radical arms control process that ensued since the early 70s but gained momentum after the late 80s. With a, with, with a series of very important treaties, which eventually reduced the numbers of nuclear weapons in the world almost by an order of magnitude. That's almost by ten times, depending on your <coughs> uh, on, on your counting rules. So now the, the this first myth goes that since we have much fewer nuclear weapons, their use may be selective, may be controlled, may be integrated integrated with the use of innovative uh, conventional systems with pre precision guidance, with uh, systems based on new physical principles like directed energy, lasers and others, uh, with cyber warfare, and you can actually uh, selectively use nuclear weapons and win, or at, leave, or at least achieve success in a war. And that is why arms control is not needed, because it binds your hands in developing whatever you want to develop to enhance capability, to control escalation, and to deny success to the other side or provide success for your own side, to end the war on favorable conditions, as strategists put it. That's the one myth. One myth. The other myth is that those negotiations are conducted for a very long time and when the treaty is signed already, uh, the, arms, uh, the, the new weapons are developed, they go ahead of the arms control treaties uh, and uh, you, you, you can deal with that in one big great act. Stop those excruciating, exhausting negotiations just sign the treaty to end, to end with nuclear weapons. And in fact, such a treaty was elaborated and adopted at the United Nations General Assembly in summer of 2017. And already uh, was signed by 70 member states of the United Nations and is being ratified by many of those. And, um, once it, it, it is ratified by 50 states, it enters into force. So that, that is, the myth is that it can work. First of all, because neither of the nine nuclear weapon states supported this treaty. <laughs> and it's those states which will have to implement it. But uh, the reasons why it is a myth are more important than that. They are much more deeper. Uh, I do not want to elaborate on that now, but if you are interested, we can discuss it uh, after my presentation. And now, the third myth is that we have to retain arms control, but the old methods of arms control, those long negotiations, ceilings, sub ceilings, qualitative limitations, they are all outdated because the world order has changed. We no longer have bipolarity, as during the Cold War time. We presently have multipolarity. And uh, uh, conventional and nuclear weapons are integrated. The line between nuclear and conventional systems is being blurred. We have a number of new technologies, so which are very difficult to deal with and by the old methods of arms control, which rely very heavily on verification capabilities. And since uh, a lot of weapons are presently dual-purpose weapons, you cannot distinguish between nuclear and conventional, and their limitations are no longer possible. So you have to change the arms control mode. You have to go from the old negotiations to the new ones. Various forums of uh, multilateral discussions, not on limits and sublimits, ceilings and sub -ceilings, but discussions on uh, enhancement of nuclear deterrence so that the crisis does not escalate to nuclear war, providing for transparency and predictability of arms programs. 
And that is the way for the future. No longer bilateral treaties, no longer uh, verification systems of that type. Uh, we have to, to do something new. I will deal with the third myth, because to my mind, it is the worst. It's the most detrimental, the most harmful, because uh, it is easy to accept the superficial, superficial system of arguments, multipolar world, new technology. Well, even those who do not study that professionally, they read about that, they hear about that, that sounds very persuasive. And also, uh, because really people see that the world is multipolar, why conduct bilateral negotiations? We have to conduct multilateral negotiations. Um, and we should uh, do it much faster and limit ourselves to politically binding commitments on transparency measures, predictability, and so on. Some all those things which will make uh, military conflict and escalation less probable. That is the way for the future. It's easy to accept, and that is why uh, it's very deceptive. And moreover, uh, it is welcomed by political leaders because it basically tells them, you have done nothing wrong. The crisis of arms control is natural, unavoidable, it is not because you did not do your job properly, it is because the situation has changed so dramatically. And for the future, uh, do not worry, you can live without arms control. Uh, we can uh, propose a number of various surrogates, palliatives for that. You will not have to uh, supervise many years of very uh, difficult negotiations on which you resolve conflicts at the table of negotiations, but even more so inside your countries, finding a consensus between uh, conflicting interests of uh, defense agencies and uh, industrial corporations and uh, public opinion and uh, uh, all kinds of vested interests which make you accept responsibility, for which later you may pay. And look at what happens with Gorbachev now. He accepted enormous responsibility when he approved of the INF Treaty, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, when he approved of Conventional Force Reductions Treaty in Europe, when he approved START I Treaty with deep reductions of nuclear weapons. Now he is a victim of never ending campaign of slander and attack for his misdeeds in the past, which were detrimental to the security um, of the Soviet Union and Russia. So, uh, this third school relieves political leaders of that responsibility. You may conduct arms con control by going into various conferences and making speeches and signing uh, joint uh, declarations, joint, joint documents, and that's it. So, that is why this school of thought which is gaining momentum in the United States and in Russia, is the most harmful, in my opinion. It is based on, on a number of myths, uh, dealing with technology, dealing with uh, arms control negotiations and treaties. <clears throat> I do not have time to elaborate on that. I will deal with only one myth, and that is the myth about multipolar nuclear war, multipolar nuclear world. Uh, during several previous decades, it was Russia, in particular Russian top state leaders, who repeatedly said, we have to change bilateral mode of arms control to a multilateral, because beside Russia and the United States, nuclear weapons are in possession of a number of other states who are building them up. We are reducing and they are increasing. We have to involve them in nuclear arms control, otherwise we cannot go any further. The United States uh, was not so enthusiastic about this idea. It did give it lukewarm support. And once uh, we even had a joint 
uh, resolution proposed at the United Nations <coughs> General Assembly, that was in 2007, to make INF Treaty, when saying INF Treaty, you, have, you understand what, what I have in mind, Inter Inter Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, that one which, uh, which collapsed this year on medium-range missiles uh, of uh, Russia and the United States. <coughs> so, uh, to make this treaty multilateral, and uh, Russia and the United States jointly proposed this resolution. Of course, it was uh, rejected by other states, uh, but uh, uh, more or less the United States supported this idea, of, although not very actively. They never promoted it actively. It was Russia, which was repeatedly putting it forward. As you know, recently the two sides changed their positions. Uh, all of a sudden, after abrogating uh, the INF Treaty, the United States became active enthusiast about multilateral arms control, in particular involving China. Involving China, now position of the United States is that we have to involve China, involve China, in the follow-on INF treaty, if we ever to, are ever to sign it, and uh, to the follow-on START treaty, if we are ever to sign the START treaty. So, uh, because China is building up, uh, Russia and the United States uh, uh, eliminated their medium-range and short-range missiles uh, 30 plus years ago, and, but China has building them up, and presently has about 2,000 of those. This is official American figure. I do not know what are the counting rules of that figure. To me, it looks too high. Uh, but uh, certainly China has hundreds and hundreds of such missiles. <coughs> and China has uh, some of them equipped with nuclear warheads, but most of them with conventional warheads. And it, uh, those missiles are targeted at neighboring states um, in particular, American allies, American forward bases, uh, and in case of war, in case of conflict with the United States, and for instance, because of Taiwan, conflict because of Taiwan, because of Chinese decision to reunite by force. Uh, and if there is a conflict, China would uh, decimate American forward base systems and uh, American allies, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, um, uh, Guam, uh, the, um, the base where the American bases are uh, located, uh, Philippines and others. And the United States will have to respond only with massive nuclear strike. And China already has intercontinental nuclear missiles which will inflict unacceptable damage to the United States. That is why the United States needs such missiles, forward base in Asia, to deter Chinese use of such missiles, both nuclear and conventional, in case of a serious conflict uh, between China and the United States. Well, the second reason was, of course, accusation of Russia of violating this treaty by deploying a new missile, new missile tacitly, which was, which was in violation. But the principal argument was about China. Russia uh, all of a sudden supported Chinese position and China said we are not going to join such negotiations. We have much fewer nuclear weapons than Russia or the United States and so uh, we are not willing to join. Before we join you have to reduce to our level and then you may invite us and we will think about joining. And all of a sudden uh, Russian president said okay if China doesn't want what can we do? And there are some reasons behind Chinese argument. They really have much fewer weapons than Russia or the United States. One might ask him, uh, why were you insisting on multilateral uh, negotiations for a couple of decades before that? Uh, did you think that at that time those states had much more than they have now? Uh, but there is nobody to ask him in, in Russia. And, uh, uh, not, not, not many people are asking him about that here in the United States, so he can easily get away with uh, this all sudden change of position. Now what about this myth? 
the world is really multilateral. It's, it's sufficient to look at the relations between the United States and the European states and Japan, or to look uh, or, um, at relations of Russia and its neighbors, or to look at Syria. Russia and the United States are no longer capable of uh, uh, doing everything in bilateral way, resolving our conflicts in bilateral way, as they did uh, during most of the Cold War. But if we are talking about nuclear weapons, we have to look at nuclear dimension of multipolarity. And if you look at that, you'll find out that despite very deep reductions of nuclear weapons in the world during the last 30 years, the proportion of Russia and the United States in this aggregate numbers did not change much. Before the signing of the first radical strategic arms reduction treaty, that was START 1 in 1991, uh, United States and the Soviet Union at that time uh, jointly possessed about 98% of nuclear weapons of the world, of the world arsenal, which was very big, as I mentioned, 45,000 nuclear weapons. In 20, 2010, when the last START treaty, the new START was signed, this proportion reduced to about 95%. And presently, it's about 92%. So the overall reduction is very impressive, but the change of, uh, of the role of nuclear, of the two nuclear superpowers is not so serious. So the, this is the first myth uh, which uh, is uh, attractive to general public, to politicians who do not uh, know these numbers, but uh, it, is, it is totally wrong. Of course, it's possible to object to that. that it's not only quantity which, which matters, it's also quality. And the fact that China is now covered, continental United States, with strategic weapons, and most of Russia with strategic nuclear weapons, is changing the dimension very radically. That part of argument I am ready to accept. Uh, we have to think about China. Even if we continue in a bilateral way, we will have to keep China in mind when we discuss further reductions and uh, limitations, if we ever come down to this job. But even now, we have to think about China as a possible member or participant in arms control. And that is why I called this uh, presentation New Era of Arms Control, because it might include China. But there are a number of very important reservations which I have to make before I uh, come to a particular option. One is that states join nuclear arms control not because it's a nice thing to have. They join it only when it's serious arms control dealing with weapons. They join it only when they recognize that it will seriously improve their security. And in particular, that for their limitations and reductions, the other participants would reduce and limit something which is of concern to you. And that's how Soviet-American negotiations on strategic arms started 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, and how they were conducted. It's not for, any, for general good of the world. It's because of particular strategic calculations that with arms control you can achieve something which will be beneficial to your security because the other side will do something which is of, you, of your concern. Uh, the second reservation is that uh, the uh, end of arms control, the end of negotiations and conclusion of arms control treaty usually envisions equality or parity, at least in the numbers of weapons which are the subject of negotiations. Not because parity is necessary for deterrence. You could deter the, the other side with much fewer weapons because nuclear weapons are immensely destructive. It's because no side would agree 
no country would agree to legalize its inferiority. So the end of negotiations has to be equality, or as we call it, parity in strategic arms control. Third reservation. When you are looking for weapon systems which have to be subject of negotiations, those are weapon systems that matter to both sides, or to three sides if we are talking about trilateral negotiations. And they have to be to form a starting point from which you can proceed. If one side has enormous superior, superiority in particular weapons over the other side, then negotiations are uh, quite improbable, because uh, it, they will either provide the other side with capability to build up to, to much higher level, so what is the benefit for the, for the first side, or they will have to make the first side reduce drastically to the level of inferior side, so what is the benefit for this side? So we have to find negotiations, uh, to base negotiations on weapons which are important, which matter, and which at the same time form some, some kind of initial parity so that you can come to a limit which will legalize parity, hopefully at lower levels or at some other levels. And last, uh, this is such an important issue of national security that uh, giving a, war, a word of honest is not enough. Not, you have to provide very reliable verification system in order to be assured that the other side is doing what you expect her to do when you agree to negotiate and to limit your weapon systems, or your, your weapons. For instance, during the 10 years of the New START Treaty, uh, both sides jointly conducted 300 inspections. When they come to the strategic basis of the other side, when they open the launching, launch of silos, when they count warheads, uh, when they verify bombers, what is inside, how many weapons they can carry. And they exchanged, they exchanged 18,000 notifications about everything which is happening in their strategic forces, uh, their operations, their withdrawal, their elimination, when new systems are added, characteristics, and so on and so forth. So a comprehensive verification system. And having said that, I have to mention that verification system of the new star is quite liberal. Relatively to the previous star treaties, in particular to start one treaty, which envisioned radical reductions and limitations, the new treaty it's very easy going about, uh, about verification system. It's not so stringent. So those are the reservations which have to be made. Now, let's deal with China. <coughs> if we really want to involve China, we have to persuade China in two, in, in two things. First, that it will benefit strategically from joining negotiations and signing some kind of agreement. Secondly, that the agreement will not legalize its inferiority if it is inferior in particular weapons. It provided, it will provide it with parity with the other two superpowers. It will provide it with the right <clears throat> to have its own nuclear deterrence against both Russia and the United States. This right of China has to be recognized, but it is not. It's not recognized by Russia because allegedly we are friends and friends do not have mutual nuclear deterrence. And it's not recognized by the United States because they don't want to recognize Chinese right to have assured destruction capability against the United States. So there are some important things that Russia and the United States will have to concede in advance inviting China. And let me uh, immediately mention uh, one of the conclusions, which I may forget to mention afterwards, that there is a great illusion in Russia and in the United States that by going from bilateral to multilateral format, it's the other sides which will have to make concessions. This is wrong. It's Russia and the United States which will have to make enormous political and strategic military concessions 
to forge multilateral arms control, even in a trilateral format with China. <coughs> okay, uh, President Trump and his uh, subordinates said that China has to join next um, uh, INF Treaty, if it is to join INF Treaty. So, let's look at the, at the balance of such weapons, which might serve as a starting point. This are, those of you who do not follow this thing, these are the new Chinese missiles, medium range missiles, which they showed on the recent parade, uh, national holiday parade. These are uh, hypersonic systems, not, not, not usual ballistic missiles, and you can see by the form of, the, of their nose cones, those are hypersonic systems which are boosted um, by, by, by ballistic missile boosters and then glide in stratosphere at a very high um, hypersonic uh, velocity uh, and hit their targets. So th those are the new systems, but China has quite a number of older ballistic and cruise missiles with, with, uh, with the ranges that were covered by the former INF-3. So what is the, what, well, that is a picture which just shows the strategic situation. Uh, the lines of confrontation, the conflicts around which a conflict might occur between Russia and the United States or American allies and China and escalate to, uh, escalate to, to a serious uh, conflict in which China allegedly would, will use its uh, 2,000 medium-range systems to uh, devastate American forward bases. Now, uh, this is a, what is the, the balance of ground launch, intermediate, and short-range missiles? Ground-based, because INF Treaty covered only ground-based systems. Americans have zero. Russia has probably a hundred of those missiles, which the United States made a, a point of Russian violation of the INF Treaty, and one of the two reasons to withdraw from the INF Treaty. This argument was continuing already for, for, a ten, for more than 10 years. Eventually, Americans uh, withdrew. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a subject of discussion whether they are in violation or not, but I put it on the scheme uh, with a question mark. That might be the number uh, that, uh, that Russians have according to American uh, suspicion. And those are Chinese missiles. Those about 2,000, which are mentioned in US official documents. Uh, about 100 of those are nuclear, others are conventional, precision guided systems. So you see the balance is tremendously asymmetric. Any trilateral agreement which we could base on this, on these weapon systems, would either provide Russia and the United States with the right to build up to very high numbers or make China to reduce to very low numbers, getting nothing in return. <coughs> that is the reason why China flatly rejects this proposition and indicates that beside medium range systems, there are tactical nuclear systems, there are strategic intermediate systems in which Russia and the United States have enormous superiority over China. The, this is the, the only area in which China has some kind of superiority of its own. And those missiles uh, are only ground-based missiles. So the first thing China would do if it agrees to negotiate is to put forward its own proposition. As I mentioned, it rejects invitation to negotiate because Chinese, uh, we can only guess about the reasons. Well, Chinese uh, bureaucracy is enormously uh, conservative, uh, enormously cautious. Uh, ch probably China does not, uh, does not want to disclose its secrets. It's totally opaque, opaque, does not give any information of its strategic or medium-range nuclear conventional forces. Probably does not want to disclose this information. But if China changes its mind, it certainly would come with some interesting propositions of its own. For instance, it would say, why do we address 
if it's a new negotiations, why do we address only land-based medium-range missiles? There are also sea-based medium-range missiles, in particular cruise missiles, which the United States have, are called Tomahawk, long-range systems, formerly they were nuclear, now they are conventional. Uh, Trump administration has proposed to again to, 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 to equip some of them with nuclear weapons. So the logical Chinese position would be, let us address both land-based and sea-based medium-range missiles. Now the balance looks like that. The United States has Tomahawk missiles on its attack submarines, on its retrofitted four tri Trident strategic missile submarines, in which instead of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles uh, were installed. Uh, and the United States um, uh, deploys them on submarines and on surface ships, on cruisers and carriers. And overall numbers are higher than 5,000. Of course, all Chinese missiles are deployed in Asia. American missiles are deployed globally in Asia, in, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in, in, in the Arctic, in, in, in the Indian Ocean. But the ships are very mobile things. You cannot limit them according to particular region where they might come tomorrow. Either you cover them globally or you do not cover them at all. So that would be a Chinese proposal. Russia also is deploying such, uh, uh, well, here are Russian ground-based missiles, but also Russia has uh, sea-based missiles, caliber type, which were recently demonstrated in Syria many times. Uh, so that would be a balance that China would favor. According to this balance, the United States will have to reduce drastically to Chinese level, instead of China reducing down to some uh, level or to zero. Uh, as for Russia, it, 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 it will be in a precarious position because it will have either to build up or to build down, but the, the most important part participants of that are China and the United States. So, uh, that will not work, uh, and China certainly, if Americans reject it, which they are, Americans are certain to reject, then uh, Chinese would um, uh, say, look at the strategic balance. This is the balance of strategic weapons. The only strategic, not, no medium range systems. Nuclear, nuclear weapons, Russia, United States, China, and Britain and France somewhere, somewhere there. Uh, according to Chinese logic, it's the two superpowers which have to reduce drastically in order to achieve parity and open the way for negotiations on intermediate range systems. All right, uh, having said that, it does not mean that you cannot devise the way of trilateral arms control. You could do that if you want. And here is one of the options which might, uh, might serve as, a, as, a, as, an, as an illustration. The idea is to integrate intermediate range uh, missiles and strategic forces, punch them together. With respect to strategic forces, you, have, you will have to calculate air-launched cruise missiles both nuclear and conventional, as we did on the START one. The new START does not count them. It only counts bombers and uh, assumes uh, each bomber to have one nuclear weapon, when in fact each bomber can carry up to 20. So, in order to be more honest, if we are calculating Chinese medium-range missiles, both nuclear and conventional, we have to calculate to include Russian and American forces, which are also nuclear and conventional. And part of those bomber weapons are conventional, not only nuclear, I and mean, bomber uh, air-launched cruise missile. Then you could establish a ceiling on those categories of weapons, which might be somewhere slightly lower than the present ceiling uh, of Russian, American, and Chinese strategic and, me and land-based medium-range systems. You would ask me, okay, I have included air-launched uh, cruise missiles, I have included 
land-based uh, ballistic and cruise missiles. What about sea-launched cruise missiles? Those of which Americans have more than 5,000. My answer is I do not know. Because uh, it's extremely difficult from verification point of view. But the fact that we cannot deal with them now doesn't mean that we, have, we cannot deal with anything. And arms control in the past dealt only with some issues, but didn't deal with many others. For instance, strategic arms control during the 50 years of its history have never been able to deal with limiting accuracy of weapons, which is very important. Could never deal with the yield of weapons, which is very important. Could never deal with tactical nuclear systems. Could never deal with space weapons. Could never deal with anti-submarine warfare. Could never deal with air defense and many other things. Nonetheless, it's my it's my very very strong belief that arms control had a number of historic achievements during the last fifty years. Although it could not deal with everything. And in the future, the best may be the enemy of the good. We should deal with something which is important and which we could, can manage. And leave other things like space, cyber, and many others for the future when we find the way or the interest in dealing with them. That's, that's basically all I wanted to tell you about. Uh,